You'll have no doubt seen the ISS winking silently across an inky black sky wherever you happen to live. Magnificent as this celestial spectacle is, it does beg the question, what goes on inside? Join us today as we poke around in an astronaut's home office and ask what's inside the International Space Station. Barreling along at a lively clip of 5 miles per second, the ISS weighs about 420,000 kilograms and circumnavigates the globe once every 93 minutes. It's big by space station standards, four times larger than the Russian Mir station and five times larger than the old US Skylab. And yet, the internal volume astronauts are bobbing around in is said to be only that of a six-bedroom house. The station has always been a collaborative effort. There's modules from the United States, including Destiny, Unity, Quest, Harmony, the solar arrays and the integrated truss structure that holds the whole thing together. Russian modules include Zarya and Zvezda, the Japanese contributed the Kibo module, and the European Space Agency built Columbus and the gorgeous Coppola. Harmony incorporates sleeping quarters for up to four astronauts. Sleep isn't easy when the sun rises and sets as many as 16 times a day, not least because the change in temperature causes the station structure to flex and pop. Many astronauts sleep with earplugs for this reason, in their dinky little telephone booth-sized bunks. They can sleep any way up they fancy, as up or down are concepts that don't have much meaning in a microgravity environment. How do the toilets work? A great deal of technological know-how has gone on solving this problem. Essentially, there's a commode with a vacuum cleaner attached. Flushing water would be wasteful and heavy, but flowing air can suck away any noxious waste into a bag in the case of solid waste. Liquid waste gets purified back into drinking water and breathable air, which is the only efficient way to go, and nobody seems to mind all that much. Having a solid, reliable toilet – the Russians have their own separate system – is seen as vital from a well-being point of view. Once on the old Russian station Mir, a power failure caused astronauts to rely on using emergency plastic bags. Morale predictably plummeted. A great deal of time and space aboard the ISS is given over to exercise. Without it, astronauts' muscles and bones would wither and atrophy. This is because on Earth, gravity is constantly pulling against the human musculoskeletal system, which keeps it in good shape. Observations have shown that bone density drops sharply unless the crew work out for a minimum of two hours every day. There are three main pieces of workout gear on the station. A treadmill, which is situated in Node 3, aka the Tranquility Module. This treadmill is an upgrade to the treadmill once used on the Zvezda Service Module, which had to be retired as the foot pounding during its use was interrupting delicate experiments elsewhere on the station. The newer Tranquility treadmill has a clever vibration isolation system. There's also an exercise bike, without a saddle because without gravity one isn't needed, and a relatively new piece of kit called the Auret, or Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. Auret, also in the Tranquility module, is a weightless lifting gym, which uses a clever system of vacuum tubes to provide resistance of up to 600 pounds. It's not just for deadlifts. Some astronauts use the ARID system to simulate swimming in space, and one enterprising ISS occupant, America's Sunita Williams, even completed the first triathlon in space. Staving off atrophy isn't the only reason for working out so consistently. Exercise also helps relieve the so-called space snuffles, caused when body fluids, no longer tugged downward by gravity, accumulate in the head. To date, around 3,000 experiments have been conducted on board, feeding into the publication of many hundreds of scientific papers. These, in turn, have led to breakthroughs in applications as diverse as 3D printing, to natural disaster tracking, to cancer drug testing. It's a messy business, too. Just look at how cluttered with apparatus the Russian-built Zarya module, aka the functional cargo block gets, somewhat reminiscent of an unloved attic here on Earth. Noteworthy science kit aboard includes the LSG, or Life Sciences Glove Box, within the Japanese Kibo module. The LSG is used for, among other things, delicate research into microbial life, which of course needs to be kept separate from the crew space. Also aboard is NASA's Cold Atom Laboratory, or CAL, which creates the conditions for producing ultra-cold atomic states known as Bose-Einstein condensates. These atoms are cooled to 10 millionth of one Kelvin above absolute zero, allowing quantum researchers to ask probing questions about the fundamental nature of matter itself. It's one of the coldest places in the known universe. The Russian half of the station has two mini-research modules. Most US science happens on Destiny, while Columbus is the European Space Agency's primary lab, decked out with 10 large rack systems that can be switched out as required. Over time, the ISS has even hosted quite a menagerie of creatures, from mice to ants, worms and even fish. If you're wondering how astronauts working in zero gravity manage to keep track
lack of their tools, the truth is they frequently don't. During their first days aboard, new astronauts routinely lose things, which is why anything that moves has a Velcro strip attached, which can be attached to similar strips you'll have seen plastered all over the inside of the crew spaces. It's a simple solution, but it works. You may also have noticed handrails used by astronauts to help propel them around the station. Interestingly, astronauts who've spent a lot of time aboard develop calluses on the tops of their feet as opposed to the soles, as that's where the pressure is applied in microgravity. The station itself requires constant maintenance, which means astronauts need to be something of a jack of all trades. As former ISS astronaut Thomas Marshburn put it, we have to be plumbers, electricians, and construction engineers, at the same time running a laboratory and being scientists. It's very exciting, it's a lot of fun. At some point, they need to eat, which presents a lot of its own challenges. Sandwiches, for instance, are a big no-no. Anything that creates crumbs which can float away causes problems. Fungi will happily grow on any morsels that drift into the innards of those twisty wires and racks. Tortillas are a favourite. The first ever ingredient grown and eaten in space was a romaine lettuce back in 2015. Last year, the astronauts' dietary situation improved substantially after the delivery of the University of Colorado's groundbreaking freezer-refrigerator incubator device for Galliand experimentation, or fridge for short. It has no moving parts, which makes it more reliable, and doesn't create its own heat the way a regular Earth fridge does. Meats are typically exposed to ionizing radiation, which ironically makes them healthier by extending their shelf life. Most food is dehydrated, as moisture is a breeding ground for unwanted microorganisms. Typically, food packets are opened with a pair of tethered scissors, and cutlery is magnetic to prevent it floating away. Salt and pepper come in liquid form as convection currents need gravity to function, so hot water or energy-intensive forced air convection is preferred. Smoothies are a good bet, but even the mechanics of flavor don't quite work out in zero gravity, which reportedly impairs enjoyment and overall morale significantly. But when you get to gaze out of the station's magisterial cupola at the hazy blue planet below during moments of downtime, this probably seems like a reasonable trade-off. And the crew do get to enjoy plenty of leisure activities. In 2012, Japanese astronaut Satoshi Yoshi Furukawa took a Lego set of the ISS aboard to keep him amused. We've all seen Chris Hadfield boomering up the gap with his acoustic guitar, but you probably don't remember the former USAF colonel Catherine Coleman who brought up not one but four flutes. She even performed a gig live from the ISS, which was broadcast on NPR. Frank Colbertson went one step further and took aboard his trusty trumpet. We can't be sure how his fellow astronauts felt about that stunt. What do you think? Would the weird food, vacuum toilets, and trumpet-playing roommates be worth going into space for? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more high-living tech content.